With the world of business and careers changing by the week across all industry sectors, the most successful pharmacy business today and into the future will definitely be the ones that change the way they view pharmacist recruitment, career and development. Welcome to Pharmacy View Business Podcast Series, where we provide regular interviews with pharmacists and key people within the Australian pharmacy and associated industry. I'm your host, Scott Carpenter, and with co-host pharmacist Kavita Nadan, our guest today is Lisa Golden from the newly formed Kismet Capital Group. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. I had the pleasure of meeting you last month at the Attained Pharmacy Industry Dinner here in Melbourne. You've also been around the pharmacy industry for a little while, so there's probably quite a few people do know you, but for anyone listening today that may not know you, who is Lisa Golden? Good question, good question. I've been in and around community pharmacy uh, what feels like my whole life. I started as a pharmacy assistant up in country Queensland in an independent pharmacy. Uh, Worked my way through uni, didn't study pharmacy, um, but straight from uni started working as a rep. Um, most recently uh, spent four years as the marketing director with Apotex and then on to Brand Pharma as uh, director of strategy and development at Mundi Pharma and then uh, lured back to generics by Dennis Bastis to work with Arrow and part of the merger uh, to Aratex. So I've um, been in and around it for a long time, passionate about community pharmacy. Um, so yeah, that's me. Excellent. So, and again, uh, great to connect uh, from my perspective. So, great intro, and I guess let's move on to Kismet Capital because I've had some history with Mark Churchill and the Allfin Group, and I see yeah. this week that you've just announced a brand change. So, can you give us an update on what's going on there? Yes, uh, absolutely. It's been a very busy week. Uh, so, we've been busy for the last six or nine months um, working towards uh, the Kismet Capital rebrand. So when I joke with Mark and with the team, you know, we've changed everything but their mobile phone numbers to date. So uh, email addresses, processes, systems, we've recruited, we've updated the operating model um, and, and all in the name of sort of optimising the opportunity. Uh, so we've got quite a unique suite of products and the orphan business was reflected more the broking business, whereas Kismet Capital is, is more a holistic suite of uh, ownership and finance solutions for community pharmacy. So we've recapitalised, we've restructured, we've punched in some cash, we've uh, recruited, we've realigned, we've, uh, you name it, we've done it and we're in the process of relocating tomorrow as well. To Again? So, <laughs> we've been busy. <laughs> yeah. 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 And Lisa, I noticed one of the statements was around, and it certainly I think ties in here nicely, and Kevin, you might want to jump in here, is that is around pharmacy financing for new pharmacists to come into the ownership model. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. This is probably the real catalyst. I mean, uh, Allfin has been providing finance to pharmacy for, um, for a very long time uh, and has an incredibly good relationship uh, and reputation in the market. Uh, a couple of years ago, we developed a new product uh, called the Allfin Cat uh, Interest Fund Series 1, very sexy uh, non-marketing name for an investment fund. Uh, and that was really about you know, providing a financial solution, um, an independent financial solution for first-time pharmacy owners um, to be able to, to balance the, the risks and incentives available for them to sort of take on the, the role of ownership. So we've spent the last two years trialling it. Um, we've got 22 stores funded under this model. Um, we've learnt a lot. Uh, we've adapted it. We've, um, you know, we've invested in it. And I guess the, the rebrand to Kismet is really reflective of the evolution, not just of, of pharmacy finance, but, um, you know, the product offer that we have. So we just thought it was a good opportunity to, to reset uh, and focus on, um, I guess, repowering pharmacy ownership. Um, you know, not just empowering pharmacy ownership, but repowering it, because I think we've kind of come to a bit of a, a stalemate with pharmacy ownership in Australia. So um, generally, who would be like, what would be the criteria to be able to get this sort of um, backing, I suppose? Would it be like, you know, your first time junior partners? Would it be just anybody really? Or what's, yep. what's the deal? No, it would be anybody. So it's, okay. it's a finance solution, uh, mm -hmm. effectively. Um, so... Uh, I, mean, I guess the, the key pharmacist or borrower that we have in mind is, is a first-time pharmacy owner um, mm -hmm. who, you know, all of the risk associated, you know, prices have gone up, 
Um, the risks of, of one to you know one to one pharmacy ownership has gone up. Um, LVRs have gone down, so the the equity required to, to gain ownership uh, is just getting uh, harder. So um, this is about providing them a, a loan where they can provide where they can contribute you know zero percent equity if they'd like. Um, to access the loan, but not necessarily just for first-time owners. We also work closely with pharmacies looking to refinance to start to take a step back. Now, the other thing we're very passionate about is um, succession planning in pharmacy. You know, um, you know, pharmacy owners are getting older. Um, that's just the way that the pharmacy industry is. So this provides an opportunity for them to finance in. You know, their, their gun managing pharmacist um, without yeah. having their, their own equity on the line. Um, or for some groups looking to expand their footprint and buy more stores, but not necessarily having the equity up front to do so. So it's kind of a, a good option for everyone. Um, like any finance solution or product, I guess it's just about figuring out what's right for you at that point in time and then understanding how it works. Okay. Now, look, that's great. And I think that's a, just a nice then lead into where we want to take the discussion today. So thank you for telling us about yourself and, and also the update on Kismet. And, uh, but really, it's today about <clears throat> talking of what does the future of pharmacy look like around ownership, um, partnership, uh, management, career development, because certainly one of the things that I took away from the Attain a Dinner um, was from that panel and, and the presenters that if you've got an intern coming into your pharmacy today and they're not seeing... Um, a, a happy, content workplace, um, and let's be honest here, the last two years haven't been great, the, nope. the ability to recruit a pharmacist into that model is becoming harder and harder. So so talk to us a bit about your views on that and, and where we go to from here. And, and Kavi, I think this is, you know, from your perspective, a great great uh, chat to have. So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, listen, I think, I, I think there's, there's many factors, I think, that find ourselves where we are today. You know, um, last week I was presenting at the Pharmacy Alliance Conference and sort of talking with them about the evolution of pharmacy finance. You know, if you go back 50 years, we had wholesaler guarantees. Um, and if you go back 30 years, um, you know, we had a, a LVR from the banks of 90, 91% on prices that were probably half what they are today. So, you know, the evolution of pharmacy finance means we've, we really have this concentration of ownership uh, in a small group of owners in pharmacy. Um, Interestingly enough, that doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities for young pharmacists or female pharmacists to find themselves in partnership, but really the onus and the burden to introduce them in most instances is to be vendor financed in by a senior partner. Um, you know, that, that happens a lot. You know, we hear great, amazing stories uh, and we hear some god awful stories that people have experienced through this process. So at the same time as you've got this concentration of ownership, if it wasn't for that concentration of owners taking it upon themselves to use their own equity to finance in uh, working partners, there really is no other solution for it. Because if you can point me towards a 30-year-old pharmacist who has saved up half a million dollars to pay a deposit on um, buying a pharmacy uh, and taking all of that risk for the first time, then I'd love to meet them and I'm happy to do their finance for them. Um, but but they're, they're, they're few and far between. So uh, I think if we want to get really um, serious about this, we need to stop talking about the issue in the abstract. Um, but actually, because to, to talk about it a lot, and you know, I've um, uh, you know looked at some Guild quotes from 2005 and some Frank Siriani quotes from a couple of years ago. Now this isn't a new issue. It, we've known it's been coming, but. To have the conversation without a, a true, tangible, you know, solution uh, and viable products to help them do it, and and help um, older pharmacists step back without risking their own equity, um, and help younger pharmacists step up to optimise an opportunity and the performance um, is to yeah have the conversation in the abstract. So, you know, we're quite keen on this product being an, an independent. Um, product, which is overseen by an external trustee who has no interest in pharmacy other than he oversees this fund. Um, so it means that we can operate at an arm's length, di arm's length distance. Um, there's conflict between us and a buying group or us and other owners um, or us and, and a certain price. It's really about you know, providing a, a solution for people looking to either you know, finance their first pharmacy, finance their fifth pharmacy, or, or potentially you know, take a step back yeah. So on that note, is there a risk 
given the demographics of the current ownership, and, and I think it is still quite broad across the countryside, but but as you've mm. said, there's this mature group now that have had a great career in pharmacy and they're on their way out. And yeah. to a point, their easiest option might actually just to be sell the pharmacy, I've had a great career, I'm out of here kind of thing. And I, and I know quite yeah. a few that have done that, but that that then rolls it into a new model as to, A, can they find a, 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 another pharmacist to buy it or does it roll into a group that has different structures? So, so Kevi, what, what are your thoughts on that? So it's interesting, like, listening to you, Lisa, because, you know, I was one of those ones who were ushered in by a senior um, partner in the pharmacy because at the age of 25, you have nothing. Like, you know, you just come out of uni, you've got the stars in your eyes and you just want to get out, out there and own and you don't really know logistically, especially the legalities and the financial impact that, that ensues. So for me, it was just like, yeah, cool, I get to, to be a partner in a pharmacy. I mean, 10 years on, you're like, okay, cool, I, I would like to do this now but like to have more control over how I do it right because I have the means to so I think that's really good because that to have that um, support for a, a new you know a pharmacist coming into this new is literally what we need right now mm. I talk to students and what I hear from them is ownership no that's that's not something we talk about anymore because there's this new generation who feel like it's literally out of their um, or something that they can achieve. And I feel that that's so sad because it actually can be a reality using services like this, right? Um, so very important that we get this out there and communicate it that, hey, there, this is possible, um, yeah. especially for the female pharmacists that we, we talk about. Because if you look at the split, there is a larger percentage of women in pharmacy, but where do they all go? Um, and this is also happening in that whole rural re regional space as well, because you see a lot of these owners tend to be, you know, older um, male who have run this business for years and years and years. And, and a lot of times it has been family businesses. Um, but what we need is that next succession planning. And I think for, especially as women, ownership, it can't be that working seven days a week, um, mm -hmm. running that pharmacy and building it up to, to what you need. To, that's what it was like when I first entered. Mm -hmm. that flexibility has to be the major driver in this. Um, I don't know that what your thoughts are, but that's what, like, you know, now possibly splitting that, like, you know, having a female partner come in and maybe if they do four days a week and they do do a 93, but as long as they're present and they're helping to drive it, but it needs to change now, that whole model around, you know, build, bringing in an owner to just run that pharmacy day and night and, you know, 24-7, it's all shifted. Yeah, <laughs> it really has. It, it, absolutely, Kavi. And I think that, you know, if you look, that was the sort of the model that you'd come in as a 25-cent working partner, but you'd, yeah. you'd work it, right? You would have to, you know, there's a fair bit of, fair bit of sweat equity uh, in yeah. that. Um, <laughs> And which is great, but to your point, you do then get to a point where there is a bit of a power imbalance uh, when you've got a senior partner who's provided the finance to a junior partner. You know, the, the terms of that agreement, the, the amount that's paid, and then ultimately, you know, ongoing the ability to actually influence it. Um, the performance yeah. of the store and decisions in the store can be affected as well. So, you know, yeah. what we're finding is this is a really um, again, unique, independent way to finance it. Every, it. Everyone knows what it is. You know, these documents have been cleared by lawyers, independent trustees. Uh, you know, we've spoken to the banks and they're very comfortable with it. So um, this is, I think, just about taking... And, and I wouldn't necessarily say what we're doing is revolutionary here, um, but I think that uh, we're the first... This is the first time it's been done with independent oversight. So we have mm. an independent trustee in MARQ um, who, uh, you know ultimately he is God to me you know I can't make a decision or do anything um, uh, on behalf of unit holders without you know giving clearing it with him so you know having that arm's length no conflict of interest in uh, in an industry which can be heavily conflicted um, yeah. is that you know I think the best interest of the borrower and the best interest of the unit holders can be kept um, it's interesting that you, you know, talk about women in pharmacy and, um, sorry, Scott, I think you're about to cut me off. I do talk a lot. No, not at all. The, you know, women in pharmacy and, 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 you know, I've been very passionate about this and vocal about it. And, um, you know, Dennis Bastis would give me a lot of rope when I was at Aritex to get on stage and talk about stuff and, and sponsor. <laughs> and when I resigned from, um, 
from my job with Dennis, I, I sat there and said that I, you know, for me to pursue my interest in women in ownership, I think I have to take the plunge. I have yeah. to step out of my PAYG job, which is comfortable when I get paid, and I have to go out and do something on my own. Um, so, which is where I sort of found myself, you know, being a shareholder in this business is, um, you know, working with the business and then finding this is a product that can help women into pharmacy ownership. And then in the last 18 months, this is not a, a gender discussion. This is just a straight up bee farm discussion. You yes. know, lots of, lots of talent in the industry, um, you know, the, the lack of interest from graduates wanting to stay in the industry. If we don't uh, address, you know, the incentives and the opportunities and the risks um, that these junior pharmacists and potential owners face, then yes. concentration of ownership today, um, which exists, and there's mm -hmm. a of assets within the concentrated older demographic. Yes. Um, but the reality is, is that they become less attractive to those um, buyers when you can't get a working pharmacist, a, a managing pharmacist in there because, you know, the locum fees are so high at the moment that mm -hmm. if you're buying the store and, and working it yourself, then um, it makes it very hard to make that, you know, work on paper. So it, uh, unless we address one of these things, this concentration and this swirl will have to slow down. Um, you know, supply and demand is an issue in the workforce and therefore supply and demand of assets and value of assets with interest rates compounding that and global pandemic and my goodness, it's all happening. Everything's um, happening, yeah. yeah. And so it's a really interesting yeah. time. It is. And I think like, especially this new generation of pharmacists coming through as well, you know, it's the working, the way we work in our lifestyle, it's, it's completely different yeah. now as well. I mean, we want not just flexibility as mothers and, and women, we want flexibility generally. And this is yeah. all your new generation of pharmacists. What they want is the ability to work, but not have to commit that typical nine to five and five days a week. They want to be able to use that money to travel. They want to be used that money to be able to go out and and have a lifestyle which I think you know back in the day for us it was like work you work and go to work and you work hard um, and you build up and you promote but then at what cost right so I think yeah. now what we are, are facing is this balancing act with these new graduates to ensure that hey pharmacy is such a great career but we also as owners and especially the top tier or like you know the owners in that swirl, they yeah. have to they have to change the way that they practice as well um, yeah. to allow for them to thrive because that that's how you lose these new new up and coming pharmacists. Yeah, I was I was just going to say, you know, I think that the way that you, exactly as you say, Carby, pharmacy ownership has changed. Just has mm -hmm. home ownership has changed. Mm -hmm. Gone are the days where, you know, a new married couple bite off as much as they can chew, chew hard, and then raise their family in the same house for 40 yeah. years. Uh, that more, more and more what's happening is, you know, get married, buy, buy first house, you know, increase in equity, sell house, and, you know, refinance, move somewhere bigger. Mm -hmm. so yeah. It's a really different approach, and I think pharmacy ownership's the same. You know, gone are the days where you buy a pharmacy in Albany, you relocate your whole family down yeah. there, you raise your kids in the area um, and, you know, your wife works in the pharmacy and, you, and you're there for the next 40, 50, 60 years. Um, mm -hmm. you know, increasingly, there's a fluidity to the way that we live and the way that we work. And I think that, you know, we have to have uh, solutions and products which enable, you know, pharmacists to, you know, apply that same fluidity to how they own and run a business. And yeah. they don't want to be, you know, stuck in these four walls for the next 40 years. You know, the game's changed a little bit. So uh, you know, solutions and, and need to change and, and the way we approach it as an industry have to change as well. Okay. Yeah, Lisa, I'll, I'll ask this question, and Kevin, you can probably come at the end of this one as well, around the, the financing model for younger pharmacists. The the other thing that's changed in pharmacy um, over my time is the trading hours. You know, we gone mm. to the days that it was probably five and a half days, you know, um, might have been nine to five, and it, it's a lot longer now. So the, the pressure on a, on a single owner pharmacist has just got greater. If you're not working yeah. the hours, you're trying to find someone to work the other hours. So is there a model coming forward that two or three pharmacists could actually get together and buy a pharmacy? Because the trading hours are there to support it. You're going to employ someone anyway. 
the the workload behind it in terms of specialisation and, and whether it's dispensing, whether it's vaccinations, whether it's um, any of the other services that the, I think the Pharmacy Guild have done a great job in terms of extending the service offering and the remuneration for that these days. So, so is that another option to look at? Not necessarily trying to do it on your own, but hey, I want I want a lifestyle that I can have some time to myself. I don't want to be working 60 and 80 hours a week, but maybe two or three of us can get together and and fund fund this pharmacy. Is that is that a, an option? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we have that t today. Um, and I guess in, in the simplest form, it's an option um, with a traditional finance model, sort of bank debt or dumb debt, um, where you could pull your funds and you can go and um, buy a, a pharmacy together. Well, that's not that common that that, that happens. But um, we do have examples uh, in our portfolio of stores that we fund, where we have funded in an owner 100%. So I've got uh, a gun female um, owner who was funded into ownership, uh, is knocking it out of the park, lives and works in the town, and the pharmacy is performing brilliantly. And she's talking about, you know, how we can help her invest in in growth opportunities. I've got a young pharmacist in um, uh, northern New South Wales in the country. You know, he's taken a 50% stake with a senior partner, um, but you know that will probably over time look to evolve that he would either take that 100%, or to your point, there would be nothing stopping um, two pharmacists sort of saying, "Well, let's approach this together um, and take 50/50." There's nothing to say you have to have a senior. Um, um, finance or senior pharmacist in the transaction. Um, you know, this is about providing, you know, young, passionate pharmacies and aspiring owners, um, and helping them into finance. And not always young. Remember, like sometimes opportunities happen for um, for not so young. And I'll consider myself not so young. Um, so, you know, if, if the opportunity presented now, I think what you know what doesn't change, regardless of the product, is it's about finding the right pharmacy at the right price um, for the right person. So it, it's having to find that beautiful mix because regardless of what product you use, whether it's vendor finance, whether it's rich Uncle Gary who gives you, you know, $5 million, if you overpay for an asset, you know, it's so hard for you to, to catch up and, and chase your tail. So we wouldn't finance people into a situation where they're overpaying for an asset. Um, so it's the right pharmacy at the right price with the right right borrower or pharmacist in there and you know we see that increasingly um you know the stores that we fund in this model are the ones that are performing uh, outperforming um, expectations yeah and I, I i guess just on that point um it's quite like you know trading hours is one thing but this increasing scope of practice is just going to have to push that yeah. i mean I, I can already see it like with the whole vaccination is one thing but start to put in more things like maybe diabetes checks or blood pressure checks, your meds checks, you know, really building out that whole professional service side of things, you're going to have to increase either your opening hours or increase the number of pharmacists you have on. So typically it's just the natural flow, I think will follow in that way. Yeah. yeah. I, I was certainly also interested at that um, dinner that we were at, Lisa, that the, the Frank, so the stats that Frank put up around, oh, sorry, no, I think it was Natalie put up around, you know, who's likely to sell in the next, you know, six to 12 months. Yeah. Um, and it was a combination of the older uh, mature pharmacists mm. looking to potentially get out, but also yeah. clearly the, the middle-aged pharmacists who have just had enough and want to get out. So, so does that create yeah. opportunity or is that, uh, is it going to flood the market with pharmacies or is the market, you know, fairly static and it's com competitive pressure on the pricing because different people might want a different pharmacy? Yeah, I think um, I was really interested by that as well, but not shocked. You know, I think pharmacy have, you know, been frontline now. And I don't want to say the C word because God knows we're sick of talking about it. But, you know, what, what we're seeing when we interact with, with our pharmacies is they're tired. Um, you know, staff are tired. Um, I think customers are tired. I think staff, you know, owners, um, managing pharmacists, um, that everyone's exhausted. So I think that it's not shocking that more people are wanting to either get out completely um, or, or take a step back. Um, do I think it's going to flood the market and change dynamics? I think that that will self-correct with workforce issues. You know, one of the reasons that someone's selling is they can't get um, staff. Um, you know, that that remains likely remains an issue for the next person buying. So they, they're taking that into consideration in their calculations, cost of capital. Um, 
and cost of workforce in that store. So uh, I, I don't think that prices will go crazy. I think maybe with increasing interest rates, you know, we might see, um, yeah, I think it'll be interesting over the next little while, but I, I don't expect that, a, you know, a flooding of pharmacies on the market will increase price at all. I think as everyone sort of comes out of a, a post-COVID world and, um, and, you know, the, the Guild have done a great job of, of getting remuneration for these services. But as we come out of COVID, we do expect, you know, revenue to soften a little bit without some of the COVID-related services um, uh, in the P&L. So we sort of need to account for that. And I think that pharmacies transacting at the moment, um, we're seeing, you know, they're coming off a very high base. So, um, so it'll be interesting over the next little while. And, yeah. this, and, and Kavi, I know certainly you and I, tend to chat on a fairly regular basis and there's there's times where you're in the pharmacy and not in the pharmacy i've got a pharmacist i haven't got a pharmacy and and ultimately it was the whole evolution of locomate if we go back to the you know you're you're in my first um podcast episode on this so has that got any better of late or is that still yeah, challenging so, look um locomate uh so workforce is has been an issue like since pre-COVID times, but even more since COVID because of the burnout. And we talk about this constantly, but it's a thing and it's a thing that's going to last for a little while longer. Uh, what we are finding though is now in terms of locums and accessing locums, we're finding a lot more pharmacists are turning to locuming rather than going into the full-time, part-time position. So yes, uh, we are finding that the ability to find um, resource is better and it's increasing but what we are finding is the ability to find that part-time full-time resources that's where the issue lies and you know we have so many groups and uh, talking to us saying what's the possibility of getting people that could potentially be the next owners or, or partners um, yeah. and this pipeline we talk about right and I'm like well it has to start back at that university level and we need to get our students excited then and there so that they don't fall out at the end of the pre-reg. Um, so once we kind of start to, it's baby steps, establish all that, what we will find is that even if it is getting people into just doing locum work, you will be able to stay open as a pharmacy. What yeah. we do want to think about for future is these pharmacies who are selling, who are they selling to? And, and, and again, like, you know, um, especially the rural regional stores reach out to us constantly. Like they just want a break. Like they're like, can I just get somebody just to give me four weeks off because they just have not had a second yeah. um, off in the last two years. So um, it is getting better. We can see that there is this trend, like especially Victoria, like the, the locum pool is just increasing here. And I'm not sure why that is, but it's a thing. <laughs> and um but generally now we're starting to see that across the states as well. So it's it's now a career path, really. Locum, like being a locum, is, is a career choice and, and something that people are, are getting quite committed to doing. So I think for pharmacies, that you, they need to embrace that, as it, whether it's a short-term solution for their workforce shortage, but you've got to spend the money at the moment. You need to spend the money on locums. You cannot expect to pay them what we were paying four or five years ago. It's just, mm -hmm. no, you are looking at at least double that amount yeah. um, to yeah. get resource in. But very important, I say this to all my pharmacists and my other owner friends, like you have to give that feedback. If mm -hmm. there is a locum pharmacist who comes in and is not performing to the rate that you are paying them, you need to supply that feedback because the only way that we can ensure that the quality of these locums is like on par with what we expect and how our store should be run. So, um, um, yeah. yeah. Get it. Ladies, mm. we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, is there anything else on your list that uh, you uh, definitely want to chat about before we uh, finish up? I, the only thing I would say is, because we sort of referred back to that dinner, that there was a young um, student on the panel, I think Georgia? Yes. From yeah. memory? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she was uh, um, a breath of fresh air um, and absolutely reflective of, you know, pharmacy students and that generation uh, and, and sort of articulating what she thought and what she felt. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that we need to do better to listen to them because um, I think she she got up there and she, you know, she just... Um, and, and, yes, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't perfectly articulate and considered and succinct, but she 
that, you know, she made some really amazing points. And I think, you know, you've said it, Carvey, you have to go back to the, um, you know, speak to these students and realise they're not talking to us. They're not talk. you know, we're not, we're no longer talking to, you know, people our own age. And I know that, but, you know, one thing that, you know, we, no one likes to admit is we're all getting older. Um, but the conversation and how we interact with them and, and the opportunities that we present to them and how we present to them and, um, and, the, and the risk that they're willing to take and the commitment they're willing to make um, and the incentive they expect to receive for that has changed. Um, yeah. you know, we, and we need to sort of uh, address all of those things, I think, um, at a grassroots level and then go and sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, mop up anyone hopefully that's left without the belief that they can never own a pharmacy or um, you know work in a happy environment you know we can maybe go back and um, entice them back into the industry and that's, like that. that's so good mm. ladies thank you very much for your time today i've really enjoyed this chat as i enjoy all my chats but uh, this has been a great one <laughs> um uh, <laughs> I will include um, all of your contact points in the show notes. So anyone listening today that would want to get in contact, uh, LinkedIn's a great avenue these days anyway, but we'll make sure that they're there in the show notes. So think, again, thank you for your time. It's been great to chat. Thank you, Lisa. Awesome. Thanks, guys. See you.